Good morning, good afternoon um, to everyone who's joining us now. Um, welcome to uh, today's webinar on fossil fuel investment protection and the risks for climate action. My name is Diagodie Maina and I'm a law advisor with IISD. And before we begin with this webinar, I want to begin with some housekeeping rules. So um, please feel free to use the rename function so that your screen name shows your name and your affiliation. And just a kind reminder that this is a public webinar and the recording of this session will be made available afterwards on our website. If you would like to ask a question at any point during the webinar, please type it in the Q&A box as well as the chat and we will do our best to address it. We're also pleased to offer a French and Spanish um, simultaneous interpretation and you just need to click on the little globe on the right hand uh, side of your screen and you'll be able to choose the channel of your preference. And now I'd like to hand over to Dr. Susie Nikema, who will introduce today's webinar. Thank you very much, Nyaguti. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you are based. Thank you for joining us for this ISD webinar to discuss the findings of a recent ISD report by Lea Di Salvatore that analyzes the extent to which fossil fuel investors rely on investor state arbitration and considers implication for governments that pursue the clean energy transition. My name is Susan Ikema and I'm the lead of the Sustainable Investment Work Stream at ISD. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this webinar and to introduce our estimate speakers and outline our agenda for today. Lea Di Salvatore is a doctoral researcher at the University of Nottingham whose research focuses on the mechanism regulating the fossil fuel industry in the era of climate change, climate justice, and investor state dispute settlement, ISDS. We are thrilled to have collaborated with Lea to prepare this report on investor state arbitration in the fossil fuel industry. But before we will hear from Lea about the main findings of her study, Greg Mutit will give us a brief overview of the current state of the energy transition and the most recent warnings from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Greg is a co-lead of the Sustainable Energy Supplies Workstream at ISD and has more than 20 years of experience as a researcher on fossil fuels and climate change. After those two presentations, we will be joined by an estimate panel of experts to further unpack and discuss the findings and implications of the report particularly for ISDS and investment treaty reform. For this, we are honored and pleased to be joined by two additional estimate experts, Kyla Chenhara, who is the Canada Research Chair in Economy and Environment at Queen's University, and recently co-authored a groundbreaking article in science on how investor state dispute threaten the global green energy transition. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Bart Yap. Derbeek, who is a researcher at the Dutch NGO SOMO Netherlands, where he specializes in the transnational governance of trade and investment, and particularly how trade and investment agreements protect transnational capital flows and what the implications are for equitable and sustainable economic development. On behalf of ISD, I sincerely thank you for making your time available to join us today. Know that at different times during this webinar, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Please share your questions and reflections on the chat at any time. But before we start with Greg's and Leah's presentations, my colleague Lucas Schau, who is an international law analyst at ISD, will frame the issue of investor state arbitration in the fossil fuel industry. Over to you, Lucas. Thank you, Susie. So before we get into the discussion of the exciting findings of Leah's report, I would like to briefly say a few words about why we are here to talk about the use of investor state dispute settlement by the fossil fuel industry and why we specifically consider the risks of that type of dispute resolution for climate action. With a caseload of now 1,190 treaty-based cases, ISDS is sometimes described as one of the most powerful enforcement mechanisms in international law. As Leah will further elaborate in her presentation, fossil fuel investors have long constituted the category of the most litigious claimants in ISDS, 
and existing cases have led to some of the highest awards of compensation. Investments in fossil fuels imply high sunk costs, require the development of costly and complex infrastructures, and are often made for extensive operating cycles. Economically, ISDS has functioned like a unique form of political risk insurance that offers safeguards to these particularly capital intense investments by essentially shielding them from the impact of regulatory changes in the host state. ISDS has thus become a means for investors to shift the risk of an adverse impact of regulatory change from the ultimate beneficial owners or shareholders um, to taxpayers. While the use of ISDS by fossil fuel investors is longstanding, attacks against regulatory measures adopted in an effort to fight the climate crisis are more recent. As governments are set to drastically ramp up these efforts with the goal of maintaining the world on a path to 1.5 degree of warming above pre-industrial levels, regulatory interference that adversely impacts fossil fuel investments will only increase. The quantification of future ISDS risk therefore becomes a crucial factor for policymakers as it is likely to significantly drive the cost of the clean energy transition. As recent claims have challenged um, denials of drilling permits, for example, or the cancellation of pipelines, or um, another example is the phase out decisions of governments to, um, to put an end to the use of coal fired power generation. A large part of the policy discussion appears to focus on how states can prevent being sued. But another element is the potential responsibility of those states for emissions caused by their investors abroad. This is particularly true for the most frequent conduit jurisdictions that investors use to avail themselves of particularly favorable treaty provisions. Particularly in these countries um, that we also call you know, forum shopping destinations or conduit jurisdictions, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions generated by investors abroad often exceeds domestic emissions in the home country by several orders of magnitude. And yet the adherence of home states to international investment agreements and their role in ensuring and financing such investments abroad has so far been absent from states' multilateral climate negotiations. Against this backdrop, and given the growing urgency of substantial and progressive climate policies, I would now like to hand over to Greg to take us through some of the most recent findings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to give you a very quick, a very rapid overview of the latest science on fossil fuel phase out consistent with the Paris goals. In April this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, published its sixth assessment report on mitigation. Um, a, a key, I think the, the, the driving message of that was one of urgency. The IPCC reported that global greenhouse gas emissions need to decrease by 43% uh, in the next seven or eight years in order to limit warming to, to 1.5 degrees. And this can only be achieved with quite a fundamental and quite a rapid transformation of global energy systems. In, in particular, the IPCC reported that uh, the existing infrastructure for transporting and consuming fossil fuels, such as power plants, transport infrastructure, factories, and so on, if operated for its full economic life, would lead to emissions that push warming above 1.5 degrees. Therefore, the IPCC concluded that decommissioning is going to be necessary, reduced utilization is going to be necessary for that existing infrastructure. Now in ISD, we, we did some analysis of the energy pathways that were published along, alongside, alongside the IPCC report. And we published, to try and draw out some, some more uh, policy recommendations from them, we, we published that about three weeks ago in a report called Lighting the Path and details are at the end of my presentation and we'll share the, the PowerPoint. Now we focused on energy pathways. This is descriptions of the future of the, of the energy system. Um, that come out of integrated assessment models. We focused on the ones that limit warming to, to 1.5 degrees and are feasible in terms of use of uh, unproven new, new technologies, not exceeding feasibility limits. 
So this, this first graph shows you what happens to the power system in uh, feasible 1.5 degree pathways. Global um, unabated uh, coal power generation reaches pretty much zero by 2035. Global unabated gas power generation re reaches close to zero by 2040. Now, when you bear in mind that power plants uh, commonly last 30 or 40 years or even longer, and many have been built in the last 10 years, what this implies is that some of those power plants are going to have to be decommissioned before the end of their economic life, as the IPCC says, or alternatively, we'll have to go through costly retrofits with carbon capture technology. Now, the Powering Past Coal Alliance um, has uh, member in, in the Powering Past Coal Alliance, members have committed in the global north to phase out coal power generation by 2030, in the rest of the world by, by 2050. This, these latest pathways are suggesting a, a, a pace even faster than that. And, um, in, and in, in any case, there, that we are going to need to see early decommissioning. So um, I'm going to come back to the questions this, this raises for ISDS. Looking at oil and gas as a whole in, in all their uses, um, and uh, whether abated or unabated, this is what the, the median of, of feasible 1.5 pathways from the IPCC says. Uh, global consumption and production of oil and gas declined 30% by the end of, the, end of this decade. Uh, again, it's a rapid transformation. Production and consumption of oil and gas need to decline beginning now. Now on this, I'm now super, superimposing projections of the production from fields that are already producing or are under development. And what you'd see is that the already existing oil and gas fields provide enough oil and gas to exhaust how much the world can afford to consume consistent with 1.5 degrees. There are many more fields that the industry would like to develop, which it already has the, the licenses and often permits to do so. There are also licenses in this top band which have been awarded for new exploration and a projection of how much is yet to be found. So all of this new potential production, which is already licensed by governments, is in excess of what the world can afford to consume. This next graphic uh, makes a very similar point. This is taken from a study I was involved in, published about a month ago. And what this shows you is similar to the finding about infrastructure reported by the IPCC. If you, over their full economic life, the world's oil fields, gas fields, and coal mines, the emissions from that oil, gas, and coal would significantly exceed the carbon budget, the amount that we can afford to burn consistent with 1.5. So some of those existing oil and gas fields will have to be closed down if we don't have large scale availability of, of carbon dioxide removal technologies. I'm gonna skip over that, over that slide. And um, fi finally, just to, just to say the, the more positive side of the message is that the IPCC report said this can be done. It is possible to uh, meet the world's energy, energy needs while reducing fossil fuels at this pace, and they can be replaced with uh, renewable energy, and in particular, wind and solar. However, massive investments are needed to make this possible. Um, what, what we see looking again at these feasible 1.5 degree pathways is that there's an investment gap projected between current investment plans and, and what would be expected under current policies compared to what's needed. At the end of this decade, we see an investment gap of about $400 billion. Um, the good news is that this is less than the energy industry plans to spend on new oil and gas fields, which are inconsistent with 1.5 degrees. As the IPCC says, there's not a shortage of money, there's just a need to ensure that the money is directed to the right places. So um, to conclude, what the, the message from the science is that there, are, there is too much fossil fuels in all kinds of, in, in numerous parts of the energy system. In order to, um, to achieve the Paris goals, we first need to stop making things worse by adding more fossil fuels. And then we need to reduce what is already in the system in order to align with 1.5 degrees. As the IPCC says, there is too much fossil fuel infrastructure, such as power plants, pipelines, and so on. We need no more um, unabated power plants or pipelines to be, to be built, but to align with 1.5 degrees, even that is not enough. Some of the existing ones have to be closed. We have too much licensed oil and gas reserves. We need to see an end to exploration licensing, as for instance, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance has committed to. But even then, we have too, too 
too much. So some of those licenses have to be somehow rescinded. And finally, even when we just focus on the fields which are already producing or under, under development, they would exceed how much the world can afford to burn. So um, we need to stop, we need companies to stop developing new mines and new fields, and some of the existing ones need to be decommissioned early. Now, especially on the right hand side of this, um, of this graphic, in all three of these areas, the problem of investor state dispute settlement is going to arise. These are things where investors already have rights to develop and, and operate. And so with that, I'm very happy to hand over to Leah's presentation. And there's the link to for more information on everything I said. And let me just uh, come here, uh, come in here. Thanks a lot, uh, Greg, for this concise and impressive overview um, of the most recent findings of the IPCC. They will serve us as an excellent backdrop for our discussion today and remind us once again, even if it cannot be said often enough, um, of the sheer urgency of rapid and unprecedented climate action. So at this point, I'd just like to remind our audience that you can post any questions you may have on the chat. So, um, and we will try our best to address them. And now with any, without any further ado, I, I would like to hand over the floor to Leah for her presentation of the findings of her report. Leah, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, morning and evening to everybody all around the world joining us today. Um, thank you, Lucas and Susie and Greg and everybody at uh, the International Institute for Sustainable Development for organizing this webinar. I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to present the report together with such incredible line of panelists. So I'll start and I usually like to start with some data to set the scene, especially after Greg's presentation on the outcomes of the IPCC assessment of the climate crisis. Next slide, please. So um, as you can see from the table in the slide, out of the $1.8 trillion of the total energy investments for 2018 and 2019, the total expenditure for fossil fuel investments correspond to more than half of the global energy investment. So we are not on track to uh, achieve net zero or the Paris Agreement, agreement objectives. Um, in fact, according to the IEA, recent investment trend is far from enough to bring lasting reduction in emissions. And as Greg just said, we need to move that money from carbon intensive industry to renewable energy. So um, next, next slide, please. Foreign investors play an important role in this market. 45 to 50% of all oil and gas industrial projects are financed by foreign companies, while 40% of power generation projects are financed through foreign direct investments. So foreign investors are important players in the field and they generally can have access to a higher degree of protection for their investments because foreign investors are generally protected by international investment law. Um, for, um, who doesn't know, international investment law is formed by various in legal instruments, mainly international investment agreements that typically include special treatment provisions and provisions on investor state dispute settlement. Um, investor state dispute settlement or ISDS allows investors to sue government for measures and actions that allegedly violate the standards of treatment granted to their investments. So, in other words, um, investors can sue, can seek compensation for lost profits and in some uh, instances, even lost future expected revenues for measures adopted by the country where they are investing. And in the last two decades, the number of investment arbitrations has grown exponentially with consistently high numbers of new cases in recent years, according to UNCTAD. Um, next slide, please. But what are um, these protections? So we don't have the time here to go into details of the provisions, but it suffice here to say that some of these special treatments can have conflicting objectives with public policy, especially climate, environmental, or even human rights ones. So um, for the, 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 for example, certain measures, like the ones that Greg was talking about, like decommissioning, um, projects that have already been granted the green light um, might um, are all measures that might be challenged by foreign investors as breach of substantive investment protection. 
And in this case, investors can seek compensation for the lost profit against such measures to international arbitral tribunal. Next slide, please. These provisions are contained in different types of international investment agreements and national laws uh, that are agreed between states or adopted by the states themselves in case of national legislations. So there are several types of uh, agreements, mainly bilateral investment, investment treaties are the most common ones. Then we've got treaty with investment provisions like the NAFTA that now is um, has been um, is the now uh, US Mexico Canada agreement. Um, the very controversial one, which is the Energy Charter Treaty, which is the multilateral investment treaty um, specific on energy investments. And then we've got a series of national laws adopted by the countries to grant extra protection. And we also find provisions uh, protecting, granting extra protection to these investments in investment contracts. So even, for example, concessions for extraction. Um, so next slide, please. So the question is, does investor state dispute constitute risk for climate action? So to answer this question, I looked at the numbers, trying to see how much the fossil fuel industry relies on, ISDS, uh, on ISDS effectively to protect its investment. Next slide, please. In my research, I have gathered a database of all the investment arbitration ever initiated that are publicly available, mainly through ICSID and UNCTAD databases. My final data set counts 1,206 investment arbitrations. And from them, how did I identify arbitrations related to the fossil fuel industry that I generally refer to as fossil fuel arbitration? Next slide, please. To identify it, I very simply, I adopted the definition of energy investments of the Energy Charter Treaty, and especially, uh, specifically the classification included in annexes EM1 and EM2. Then I identified seven uh, further non-energy fossil fuel related cases that are all related to the petrochemical industry. So, uh, the result is that, first of all, with almost a third of the sample, the energy sector is by far the most litigious under international investment law. And of, that sh of such share, the large majority of cases is related to fossil fuel investment. In total, I have identified 231 fossil fuel arbitration. That corresponds to almost 20% of my total data set, overwhelmingly outnumbering any other economic sector. So in other words, for every five arbitration, one is initiated regarding a fossil fuel investment, making the fossil fuel industry the, the, by far the most litigious industry under international investment law. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the great majority of claims within fossil fuel arbitrations are related to investment in the upstream sector, which includes uh, all the operations for the exploration of new fossil fuel reserves and their extraction, which as we understood from Greg's presentation before, we just, we cannot, um, they cannot be extracted if we want to achieve net zero or the uh, stay within the Paris Agreement objectives. So the protection of such upstream investments is particularly problematic in the context of climate change. And um, so, because as we said, as Greg stressed before, um, there is scientific consensus that no fossil fuel resource should be further extracted. We've got already uh, too many as it is. Next slide, please. Um, so, on the outcome of these arbitrations, the majority of non fossil fuel arbitrations are generally decided in favor of investors. This is particularly visible at the merit stage, where investors succeed in 72% of all cases, which is a great number. Um, next slide, please. There is one particularly <laughs> international investment agreement that is particularly problematic, which is the Energy Charter Treaty. 
fossil fuel arbitrations, generally speaking, are largely based on bilateral investment treaties, which is the most common type of international investment agreement. But as it comes out uh, from my analysis, the ECT is the single most employed international investment agree agreement relied upon in fossil fuel arbitration. Further, as you can see on the table on the right hand side of the slide, there are currently 13 ECT based pending arbitration related to fossil fuel investment. A large share of these pending cases are also related to climate or environmental measures. You might recognize number 12 and number 13, which is RWE and UNIPER against the Netherlands, against measures adopted from the, uh, by the Netherlands for the coal phase out. So the fact that the ECT directly protects fossil fuel investment de facto poses a threat to the adoption of legit regulatory measure for the green transition. Next slide, please. Moreover, the costs of arbitration are very high. The British Institute for International Comparative Law has estimated in 2021 that the average parity costs are around 4.7 million US dollars for respondent states. And this is, without, uh, this is without counting the award. So on top of that, you have to add the awards and any extra costs. So these litigations are very costly for the states and then um, the taxpayers. As you can see from the table in the left hand side, among the 10 largest amounts ever awarded in, a, in investment arbitration, eight are related to fossil fuel investment. On the right hand side, the average amount, you can see that the average amount awarded in fossil fuel cases is over 600 million US dollars, which is almost five times the amount awarded in non fossil fuel cases. And this raises a great range of issues. There are many, but mainly the one that is the most important is who, is, who bears the cost of the energy transition in this case. Um, uh, next slide, please. Furthermore, international investment law poses also a serious threat to the just transition. So generally, lower middle and upper middle income countries receive the highest number of claims related to the fossil fuel, to fossil fuel investments, mainly in South America. On the other hand, 92% of investor claimants are from high income countries and American investors alone initiated almost 30% of fossil fuel arbitrations. But in uh, recent years, there has been a rise in investor state disputes um, initiated against low income countries. This can be very worrisome, not only because such litigations uh, weigh heavily on the already very high public debt of certain global South countries, but also because such countries might sit on large fossil fuel resources that as we, we cannot stress it enough, as we understood, cannot be extracted. Um, Lastly, a particular trend in low-income countries that I have identified is that the, major the majority of arbitrations are contract-based, while in general, so a contract in between the state and the company, um, while in general, contract-based litigation only constitute 7% of arbitrations. This is a huge number, and it shows economic and power imbalance when concluding investment contracts between low-income states and global corporations based in the global north. Uh, next slide, please. Following on fossil fuel cooperation, in total, carbon majors, carbon majors, that are, these are the uh, corporations that are responsibilities that are responsible for 71% of the global industrial greenhouse gas emitted ever since 1751. So these carbon majors have initiated 46 arbitrations and the total amount awarded by arbitral tribunal to carbon majors is 19 billion US dollars. And this sum 19 billion totals only the disclosed awards. So this, must, this amount is likely to be much higher given the proportion of sealed arbitration. In fact, in the table, when you read unknown on the last um, column, it's because simply the, the amount has not been disclosed. Next slide, please. Coming back to uh, the environmental side of it, in total, out of the 73 arbitral awards 
uh, that are being disclosed of, of fossil fuel arbitrations, 23 cases are related to an environmental issues, to, env to an environmental issue. So that means that there is around a third of all fossil fuel arbitrations that are related to environmental issues. And there is a rising number of arbitration initiated against climate change measures as reported in the table on the right side of the slide. But um, they are very recent and the outcome of such arbitration is still unknown. Uh, nonetheless, given that states are going to adopt um, more and more stringent climate uh, measures, investor state disputes against such measures are very likely to increase. Next slide, please. So does investor state dispute settlement constitute a risk for clean energy transition? Next slide, please. Yes, it does. It offers a tool to fossil fuel companies to fight regulatory reforms, including environmental and climate measures. And fossil fuel companies have demonstrated over the years to have the power, the means, and the will to recur to ISDS under any circumstances, also against environmental and more recently climate change measures. Uh, so I'll leave you to that. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot, uh, Leah. Thanks a lot for this fascinating and insightful presentation about the linkages between the fossil fuel industry and investment arbitration. I know that this has been a lot of uh, information to take in, in a very short amount of time. So I would like to pause here um, and allow for any clarification questions by the other panelists and um, the audience, of course. Doing so, I would like to note that there will still be more time at the end of the, the session, um, during our Q&A session, um, to ask any questions and um, start a, a more extensive discussion on the subject matter. We will, of course, also share the recordings of today's session, as well as Leah's and Greg's slides after the webinar. So I'd now like to turn to my colleague uh, Niaguti to see if we have any questions that have been posted on the chat. Thanks, Lucas. Um, I can see two questions in the Q&A. The first one is um, directed at George. Um, what can be done for projects that already have an approved license? Countries that cancel oil and gas projects can face costly litigation cases. And the second question is addressed at Leah. How are these fossil fuel arbitration cases handled and who are the judges? Thanks a lot, uh, Niaguti. And um, if I may, maybe Leah can address uh, the second question first. The, the first question sounds like it's we can maybe defer it to the after the panel discussion because it will already probably spark some you know more extensive um, comments by all of our panelists. So um, Leah, what what if um, yeah maybe you can answer the second yes, question. Yes, yes. Um, I'll be I'll be very brief. So um, when a con uh, when an um, investor wants to bring a claim against the state for breach of protection of its uh, investment, um, it basically goes to an international investment um, arbitral tribunal. And the most famous one, for example, is ICSID. Usually the forum for uh, this type of arbitration can also be indicated either in the international investment agreement or in the contract, if it's the case, uh, if it's indicated in the contract. So um, these investors are the claimants and they bring the case and the case is then dealt with this international arbitral tribunal that are composed of generally three judges. There is one judge that is chosen by the, the claimant, one by the defendant, which is the state, and uh, one by the institution. And um, you can also have a look at the rules of the procedures, like for example, you've got ONCTAD rules, ICSID rules, uh, you can find them all online if you want to go further, but I think I, I'll keep it to that, to just the composition of the tribunals with the, with, the three, with the three judges, I think. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this clarification, Leah. And I can see that there's a second question for clarification on the chat um, where um, it is being asked, um, what is considered to be foreign investment for the purpose of your report? So I guess that would also be directed at you, Leah. Yes. Um, okay. Well, a foreign investment, um, it's 
basic it's when a company makes um an investment so that you have a foreign company that makes an investment in a host state and but the reality is that i didn't really have to answer this question for the simple reason that i'm looking at case i'm looking at arbitrations so if you've got the case this is already considered an investment if you want to know uh, more about um, for example how you can consider an investment in the international investment agreements lots of times you have the definition of investment which most of the time include concession for uh, the exploration, um, the exploitation of natural resources. It's uh, in the, usually in the article number one, you have the definitions and within the definition, you've got the definition of, of foreign investment. Thank yes. you. Yes, Th thanks a lot for this clarification and for the excellent questions. So with these clarifications in mind, I would now like to turn to our panel of esteemed experts to open the discussion. And for that, I would like to first turn to Professor Kyla Tianera. Um, so Kyla, in your recent publication in Science, you examined the tremendous costs that investor state arbitration could generate for states when adopting more progressive climate measures. Could you tell us more about how these costs come about and how investment arbitration could delay climate action in practice? Thank you for that question, Lucas, and for the uh, invitation to join this webinar. Uh, I just want to start by echoing all the comments in the chat. Those were fantastic presentations. And I also just want to congratulate Leah on the report. Such a huge amount of work went into the database that she has developed, and the report that came out of it has already been uh, so useful to me. We, we cited it in the science piece that she mentioned, and I know that other researchers are using it as well. So. It's really impressive achievement, especially to something the, to, to do while you're also doing your PhD. I wish I had done something so useful during my PhD. So really uh, big congratulations to you. Uh, so back to the question. Uh, so those for those of you that have not read the piece in science, I co-authored with uh, Rachel Thrasher, Blake Simmons, and Kevin Gallagher from the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University. Um, and I can provide a, a free access link in the chat later. Uh, basically, what we did is look at, uh, unfortunately, a hypothetical scenario because governments haven't actually done this, but uh, a scenario where they actually started to do the types of things that, that Greg was saying we need to do, where they look at the supply of fossil fuels that exceeds a 1.5 degree carbon budget and, and say, actually, no, we can't, we can't develop that. Uh, so we used, in the first instance, the International Energy Agency's net zero uh, by 2050 uh, pathway. And that was published last year. The reason we use that versus all the other sort of transition pathways that are out there is because it gave a very clear category of projects that could not proceed. They said no new oil, gas, or coal projects, uh, specifically no projects that had not already received what's called a final investment decision uh, from the companies involved by the end of, of 2021. We also said, okay, there are some limitations to the IEA pathway. There's a lot of dependence on on technologies that are still unclear whether they will actually uh, live up to expectations. So let's also look at a scenario where the projects under development, so still not yet producing, um, but that have received a final investment decision, let's say those are also canceled. So those, get, those two scenarios gave us uh, a clear body of projects within a database called RISED Energy U-Cube that we could look at. Now we only looked at oil and gas because at the time, getting good information on coal extraction was difficult, and we didn't do infrastructure like pipelines um, and gas power. I have previously done work on coal power plants with uh, Lorenzo Catula at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, if that's of interest, I can also share a link to that. But anyways, these are projects where investors, as Greg was mentioning, they already have some permits, exploration permits, or uh, some other form of, of government approval, not necessarily Thing that they need to extract oil and gas, but in our judgment, it's enough to launch an ISDS claim if the government suddenly canceled the project in line with climate science. So we asked how many of those projects are protected by a treaty. We found that 19% of the projects that didn't have a, for, a final investment decision and 12% of the projects in development were clearly protected by a treaty. And we calculated the net present value of those projects would be $340 billion US at an oil price of $100. Uh, we found uh, that the Energy Charter Treaty protects more assets than any other treaty, which mirrors Leah's findings about how often that treaty has been used. 
So in my experience, there are two reactions that people have to that $340 billion figure. Um, people who don't know a lot about ISDS say, wow, that's really high. How is it possible that investors can claim that much for projects that aren't even currently producing anything? Uh, and then people that know a lot about ISDS say, that seems really low. <laughs> I would have thought that protection was closer to 100%. And I think both of these are legitimate reactions. 340 billion is a really big number. It's more than all the public spending on climate change in 2019. And it is crazy that investors can claim all these lost future profits for oil that has to stay in the ground. But it is also, we believe, a substantial underestimate uh, of the true liability. Um, I don't think it's, it's fair to argue that treaty coverage would be close to 100% because there is a lot of domestic investment by state-owned enterprises uh, in the oil and gas sector. Um, but I do, Think. In fact, I know that it is higher than the 12 to 19% that we found. And part of the reason for that goes to that um, question of, of sort of what is a foreign investment that came up in the chat. Um, we used headquarters of the companies as a proxy for the nationality, um, but actually there are different ways to, to figure out what the nationality of investor is. And also corporations can structure their investments through different subsidiaries in different states. So you really actually need to look at the corporate structure to assess whether or not an investment um, is protected. But that was something that was too difficult to do for our uh, very large data set. Um, but we have looked at a couple of uh, investors and we published a policy brief on this on Monday. And I think Bart Yap's actually going to talk about that um, issue of corporate structure a little bit more. So I'll just leave it there for now. But just that's one reason why our estimate was too low. The other reason is what Greg pointed out that actually to stay within 1.5 degrees, we do need to start actually uh, decommissioning developed projects as well, not just the new ones. Um, and also, we, we're not doing any of this. Governments are still giving out exploration permits. So the potential liability just keeps going up and up. Um, we had a snapshot from, from January of this year, but the, the picture is sort of constantly changing. In any case, I would ultimately plead with everyone to not focus on the numbers. Uh, they grab the headlines, but I don't actually think they're the most take important takeaway from that, uh, from that study. They signal that the problem's the big one, uh, much in the same way that the numbers in Leah's report signal that the fossil fuel companies really know how to use ISDS very effectively. But just as she was talking about those issues about just transition, I think that's the real story here. Uh, it's about the distribution of risks uh, and the profound injustice that some of the countries in the world that are actually the most vulnerable to climate change could end up having to pay compensation that will ultimately end up in the pockets of wealthy shareholders and executives and companies that have done everything in their power to obstruct action on climate change. We didn't have space within the science piece to really explore these issues to the extent that we wanted to, but I would note that we have a longer companion piece that's currently in peer review I do hope to be able to share that in the coming months. But for now, I'm going to stop talking because I'm really keen to hear more from my fellow panel members. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Kyla, for this insightful explanation on your excellent science article and on the potential cost um, that ICS could generate for states, particularly in relation to projects in respect of which a license or even a permit has already been issued. So speaking about the last point that you made in relation to corporate restructuring, I would now like to turn to Dr. Bartjap Verbeek to have a closer look at the particular role that the Netherlands play in the system of international investment treaties. So Bartjap, according to UNCTAD, 125 ISDS cases have been brought by Dutch investors in the past. What explains the special importance of the Netherlands as a conduit jurisdiction and how may issues like forum shopping, for example, further complicate sovereign decisions to phase out fossil fuels in the future? Thank you, Lucas. And uh, also many thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation uh, to participate in this uh, great event. I would also uh, like to uh, congratulate Leah with her excellent research. Uh, to my knowledge, it's, it's one of the or the most comprehensive quantitative study on investor state arbitration uh, cases in the fossil fuel sector. And it will definitely become a standard reference for, for scholars, policymakers, uh, practitioners and, and activists alike. Uh, now, returning to the question, um, the Netherlands indeed plays a, a very peculiar role in the global investment treaty regime, and that is because of its role as an offshore financial center. So according to the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, 
Offshore financial centers are countries or jurisdictions that provide financial services to non-residents on a scale that is incommensurate to the, uh, with the size and the financing of its domestic economy. And we can distinguish between so-called SYNC uh, OFCs, offshore financial centers, and conduit OFCs. Uh, now, SYNC OFCs are, are, are your typical tax havens that function as the final destination for global capital flows. Whereas conduit OFCs are jurisdiction, jurisdictions that function as intermediate destinations for global capital. Now, the sheer magnitude of capital flowing through these conduit OFCs has led the IMF to conclude that we are witnessing the rise of so-called phantom capital, and that is cross-border financial investments between firms belonging to the same multinational group, rather than stimulating economic growth, job creation, and productive capacities. Uh, almost 40% of global FDI consists of phantom capital, which primarily runs through empty shell companies or a legal creation called special purpose vehicle that have no uh, real business activities, but mainly carry out holding activities, intra-firm activities, or manage intangible assets to minimize the global tax bill. Now, the Dutch government actively works to create a, a competitive and attractive business climate by offering a range of fiscal and legal benefits to multinational corporations uh, to set up holding companies or special purpose vehicles in the Netherlands. And according to the Dutch Central Bank, there are about 15,000 special purpose vehicles in the Netherlands. And these corporations can take use also of the Dutch network of investment treaties. And as a result, the Netherlands has become a real claim haven over the past decades. Unsurprisingly, almost three quarters of all Dutch cases have been filed by a special purpose vehicle, with another 9% by a Dutch subsidiary of a foreign company, and only 13% uh, um, of the cases involve like proper Dutch companies. And particularly some of the largest fossil fuel companies, they have used uh, Dutch treaties, including ExxonMobil, Royal Dutch Shell, ConocoPhillips, Total, and Eni with some of these cases producing some of the highest awards in the history of ISDS. And nearly all of the Dutch cases brought under the Energy Charter Treaty involve subsidiaries and empty shell companies of non-Dutch investors, including investors from countries that are not a member of the ECT or investors suing their own home state. Now, this opportunistic use of complex corporate structures by fossil fuel investors is particularly problematic in light of the current efforts to combat climate change. For example, in case there is no investment treaty in place between the home state of the investor and the host state in which it operates, the company can easily restructure its investments to a jurisdiction that does have an investment treaty with the host state in place. Likewise, the company could also structure its investment to a jurisdiction that has a more favorable investment treaty with the host state as compared to the investment treaty between the home state and the host state. So such treaty shopping practices puts host state governments at greater risks to face ISDS challenges and also may further limit their abilities to take measures to mitigate climate change. Now, as, as, as the previous speaker already mentioned, uh, a, a recent policy brief by the Boston University, co-authored by Kyla Tinhara, um, in fact reveals how, how the amounts of the net present value of, of fossil fuel projects covered by the Energy Charter Treaty increase when considering corporate structure. And even though tribunals would likely consider restructuring in the face of an ongoing or foreseeable dispute as an abuse of the treaty, the structuring of investments through a third country to access ISDS in light of future disputes has been interpreted already as perfectly legitimate. In fact, law firms are actively advising companies to audit their corporate structure and change it if needed to ensure they are protected by an investment treaty in light of future climate change disputes. Now, some treaties attempt to address the issue of treaty shopping. For example, Article 17 of the Energy Charter Treaty allows states to deny benefits of the treaty to investors that do not have substantial business activity, activities in the home state. However, this clause has never been successfully invoked by a respondent state, at least not in the Dutch cases. Um, other newer treaties, for example, by the European Union, require investors to have substantial business activities as part of their definitions of investor, but they don't further specify what those activities should actually entail in order to become substantial. Now, importantly, 
the new Dutch model investment treaty uh, adopted in 2019 also requires investors to have substantial business activities, but it gives some indications that should be assessed on a case by case basis, including among others, uh, the number of employees and the turnover generated. Now, this is likely to exclude empty mailbox companies from treaty coverage, but we need to see in practice how these are interpreted and applied by arbitrators. And as of yet, no single Dutch investment treaty has been amended or renegotiated on the basis of this new text, which means that fossil fuel investors can still easily use the Netherlands as a home base for their ISDS claims worldwide. I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bartjaap, for sharing this particular perspective on the role of the Netherlands in the international investment treaty regime, and uh, particularly also the intricacies of treaty shopping and of the use of conduit um, jurisdictions. Now, tying this rather technical discussion back um, to the overarching challenge of the climate crisis, I would like to turn to Greg and ask, um, you know, the risk for investor state arbitration can be said to be particularly high in situations where states take decisions that directly affect foreign investors, such as the revocation of exploration permits or the cancellation of projects that already have a final investment decision, but are not yet producing. How important is it for a net zero scenario to award the implementation of planned but not yet producing fossil fuel projects? And I believe some of it you have already um, covered it in your initial presentation, but if you could maybe further expand on that. And as a second question, to what extent does this also apply to new investments in natural gas, which is often called a transitional fuel? Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Um, I, I think on, on the first question, um, I refer back to something Susie said in, in the introduction, which, which is that one thing that characterizes fossil fuel investments is their very long time periods involved, uh, commonly a, a number of decades. Now, the the problem of carbon dioxide is a cumulative one. O over time, each additional uh, ton of carbon dioxide that enters the atmosphere increases the amount the, uh, the atmos atmosphere warms. And so is it a problem to develop new currently undeveloped projects? Well, if they only ran for a few years, maybe not so much, but that, that never happens because these long-lived projects operate for a long period in order to um, to get returns on their investment. And in the context of um, protections under ISDS in particular, that we have a, 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 a real concern about new things being developed um, and the likelihood that they would then operate for their, for their full lives. And as we saw in, in, uh, in the graphs I showed, if these projects operate for their full economic lives, we, we're going to have emissions that, that Warm, warm the planet well beyond 1.5 degrees. So um, in answer to your question, I would say that this is, this is a real problem. This is a real challenge. Um, there, there was a, a question in the, in the Q&A about what do we do where licenses have already been, been awarded? Um, I'm sure many, many of the others on, on the panel will be able to, to comment on this and, and on, on the legal dimensions of this, but um, a, a, a layperson's answer for me is, is similar to what I said in my last slide. First, stop making the problem worse and, and then make the problem better. And to stop making the problem worse, I would recommend countries don't enter into new contractual agreements over fossil fuels that will bind them for, for decades into the future and potentially expose them to uh, liabilities if, as they adapt to the energy transition. Secondly, not to enter into new um, investment treaties and ISD, in particular ISDS commitments. Um, in terms of, of making it better, um, I, I think probably the, the others on the panel can answer that better than I can in terms of how countries can begin to withdraw from investment treaties, or at least their ISDS provisions and opportunities for uh, terminating existing licenses and, and contracts. On the last part of your question, Lucas, I, I, the idea of gas as a transition fuel, it was first proposed actually in the late 1980s. And so it featured somewhat in the early phase of, of climate change conversations. And back then, the idea was that we need to gradually make incremental changes to reduce emissions and, and, um, and uh, therefore stop having a dangerous degree of, of global warming. 
Now, we're, we're now more than 30 years on since then, and the, the remaining carbon budgets are radically depleted. As, as I said in my presentation, we have a real problem of urgency now. And so the, the idea that there can be a transition, another fossil fuel, which perhaps has slightly lower emissions that we could rely on for some years or a couple of decades before moving to clean renewable energy, this, this is no longer appropriate because there simply is not the atmospheric space to absorb it. And um, in, in almost all modeled energy pathways consistent with the Paris goals, gas usage declines and in most of them it declines very fast. Um, the one exception or the, the one type of exception to that is some modeled pathways make a bet on there being a very large scale use of future technologies to, to suck carbon dioxide out of the air. And so mathematically, they say, well, you could have more gas now um, as long as that's compensated for later on. That re relying on this very large scale future technologies, which are as yet unproven, is an extreme risk in, in, in this context. So, um, and then the, the final thing I will say about the transition fuel idea is the, the idea of the concept was, well, we don't yet know, we don't, you know, back in the 90s, we don't yet have a, a, an affordable or economically viable alternative to fossil fuels. So let's use a less dirty fossil fuel before we've got one. That again is an obsolete idea because in most parts of the world, renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuels as a means to, to generate power. And in fact, in almost all of the uses of fossil fuels, in the small number of areas where clean alternatives are not cheaper than gas, they, they will be in, in the next few years as costs are, are quickly coming down. So I would say the idea of the transition fuel is obsolete, firstly, because we, we can't afford it, there is not atmospheric space for it. And secondly, because we don't need it, because the alternatives are now already cheaper. Thank you so much, uh, Greg, for these excellent explanations that uh, show us just how important it is for experts in climate policy and international investment law to come together more frequently and have such a, a discussion. Some of this already goes into the direction of policy recommendation, and, and that is excellent. And I, I would like to delve further into that in, in our Q&A session afterwards. But given that we're already quite advanced in our time, I would like to now um, move to the second round of questions and, and ask Kyla, related to the, the first question on the costs of um, ISDS, how are arbitral awards actually enforced in practice? Because I believe that it is the enforcement that will give um, the critical punch to that, um, to that system of uh, dispute settlement. And does the mere threat of arbitration sometimes already suffice to water down sovereign phase out decisions? Thanks, uh, Lucas, another great question. Uh, so yeah, so in, in contrast to international environmental law, which is where I first started studying international law, international investment law is highly enforceable. Uh, so there are two relevant treaties here, the ICSID convention and the New York convention. You don't really need to understand all the details. The important thing to understand is that if a country has signed one or both of these treaties and most countries have, then it provides a really clear avenue for investors to enforce an award. So let's say country X says, no, we're not going to, to pay an award. The investor can go to a domestic court uh, in any country where a, the, that government has an asset uh, and ask the court to effectively seize those assets. And then it can go around the world doing that basically until it can and come up with uh, the amount that covers the award. This doesn't actually happen very often because states just generally comply with arbitral awards, but there are certainly a few notable uh, instances where they have not. The second part of your question is obviously closely related to the first, as, as you say, if, if there was no teeth, if these weren't highly enforceable, then we probably wouldn't worry so much about the impacts that they could have on policy. Uh, states could, could just ignore them. But the enforceability combines with uh, the trend that we see of tribunals having an increasing willingness to award incredibly large amounts of compensation uh, based on the idea of lost future profits, which I think you saw very clearly in, in Leah's presentation, the average being 600 million for fossil fuel uh, cases means that we really do need to worry. And again, particularly in poorer countries uh, about this idea of, of regulatory chill. There are a couple different kinds of, of chilling effects. The most obvious kind would happen when an investor says explicitly, we will sue you if you do this. And the government says, okay, that sounds really bad. Maybe we won't do that then. 
Uh, but there are other ways that chill can happen. And I think with issues like uh, climate, which are global, many governments are considering policies all at the same time. So there's a legitimate concern that an ISDS case in one country might actually put off a government from in another country from doing something. So they'll say, hey, maybe we, we wanna do the same policy that that government's doing, but maybe let's wait and see how that ISDS case plays out first. This is actually something that we saw happen with tobacco legislation uh, in New Zealand when Philip Morris was suing uh, Uruguay and Australia. Now, a lot of defenders of ISDS uh, point to those cases and say, hey, the investors lost. Um, you were making too big a deal about them because the eventual outcome was good. But the cases dragged on for years um, and climate cases will too. And we really can't afford to have that kind of wait and see approach and just cross our fingers and hope that arbitrators are gonna to come to the right decision in the end. Debating, delaying tobacco labeling may well have cost some people their lives, but delaying climate action absolutely will. Uh, and it is clear uh, also that fossil fuel firms view ISDS uh, as an important tool in this regard. Chevron has said it acts as a deterrent and increases the likelihood of disputes being settled. Um, they are clearly willing to use every other tool at their disposal to delay climate action as much as possible. So why wouldn't they use ISDS? Now, I'm certainly not claiming that the threat of ISDS is the number one reason why we haven't had uh, real climate action on climate, but there is evidence that countries like France, uh, Denmark, and New Zealand have designed their oil and gas phase out plans, at least in part, to avoid ISDS cases. And I think that's very concerning. Thanks a lot, Kyla, um, for these remarks, particularly about regulatory chill, which I can say is um, a term that you have helped coin and develop in a significant way. So obviously, when we are talking about regulatory chill, the Energy Charter Treaty, which is uh, the treaty that the investment treaty that has generated the highest number of ISDS cases um, in history, obviously plays a, a major role. And I would now like to turn to uh, Batyap. Um, so the Energy Charter Treaty is the greatest contributor to ISDS claims in the fossil fuel sector and states aim to reach an agreement in principle for its modernization. And they're meeting tomorrow um, to, to actually um, make this declaration. Now, the Netherlands has actually been sued twice under the treaty, both by Uniper and RWE in respect of its decision to phase out coal-fired power generation. And I'd, I'd like to ask you uh, from, a, from a Dutch, but also you know, general European perspective, what would a modernized ECT have to look like to actually respond adequately to the climate crisis? And what do you think is the most likely outcome um, given that the states are meeting tomorrow? Yes, thank you, uh, Lucas. Uh, yeah, as the as the report of LIA also clearly indicates, uh, the Energy Charter Treaty is the most frequently invoked treaty in, in fossil fuel arbitrations. And, and also because of its multilateral nature, it, it poses a substantial threat to the implementation of, of climate measures. And the IPCC has also recognized in its latest report that investment treaties, such as the Energy Charter Treaty, uh, can indeed form a, a major impediment to the implementation of, of climate policy measures. And the treaty has been used or threatened to be used by oil and gas companies to claim compensation for, for example, banning oil and gas activities. And as you, as you already mentioned, uh, um, the Netherlands is currently facing two claims by German energy companies, RWE and Uniper, for its decision to phase out coal-fired power generation by 2030. And particularly these, these latter cases, um, in my view, are setting very important, but also worrying precedents for future climate change disputes. Um, because from the currently ongoing national proceedings before the Dutch courts, which are taking place this week, actually this morning also, um, we can already see how these companies are questioning the legitimacy, effectiveness, and proportionality of the coal phase out as an adequate measure to mitigate climate change. And they are also claiming damages based on lost future incomes. So to give you an idea, among other things, they argue that the measure, the coal, the coal phase out law, constitutes a form of expropriation because shifting to other alternative fuels uh, is not economically viable. Um, they also argue that the measure was not foreseeable and mostly informed by a political choice to target the coal-fired power plants 
in order to comply with national climate targets, which in their view does not effectively contribute to combating climate change on a global level because of potential carbon leakage effects and waterbed effects under the EU emission trading scheme. And with regard to the polluter pays principle, they argue that the burden of climate policy falls disproportionately on the energy companies, while the whole society in the Netherlands has enjoyed and profited from the energy delivered by the plants. And they even go as far to consider the entire Dutch society as the polluter here in the case. It's just to give you an overview of the type of arguments that we can expect also to, to these companies to raise in, in, in ISDS cases. Now, due to increased criticisms uh, and the controversies that such arbitrations cause, uh, the members of the Energy Charter Treaty are currently engaged in an effort to modernize the treaty and to bring it more in line with recent treaty practices and climate policy objectives. Now, however, after 14 rounds of negotiations, a compromise still seems far away. And I say seem because we, uh, there is quite a lack of transparency here on the progress of the, of the discussions. Uh, the EU, the European Union, has proposed to phase out protection for existing fossil fuel investments within 10 years after the entry into force of the modernized treaty, or latest by the end of 2040. And this means that we can still expect claims against, for example, a coal phase out uh, or phasing out oil and gas infrastructure uh, within the next 10 years. And even though the coming 10 years are crucial for the energy transition, um, and governments need to rapidly phase out fossil fuels to make a reasonable chance to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, at the same time, other non-EU members of the Energy Charter Treaty do not seem to agree with this, and they prefer to change as little as possible to the existing treaty. So as a result, delegations are currently discussing a flexible proposal under which the EU could implement its 10-year phase out for fossil fuel protection and other states could follow their own trajectories. Uh, but such a flexibility approach would still not rule out that fossil fuel companies can continue to sue states for implementing climate policy measures. And yet there still seems no, no, uh, to be no agreement on this flexibility approach. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the Energy Charter Conference is indeed gathering together tomorrow and is expected to produce a finalized text to be adopted by the ECT members at a later stage. Now, meanwhile, several EU member states are already openly questioning whether the modernization process can deliver a meaningful result and fulfill the EU mandates to bring the treaty in line with the Paris Climate Agreement. So the Spanish government already announced that it will push for withdrawal. And yesterday, also the Dutch, uh, the Dutch parliament adopted a resolution calling on the government to follow the Spanish example. So what would a modernized ECT have to look like to adequately respond to the climate crisis? Well, for a start, we need to recognize that the fundamental objective of investment treaties and the Energy Charter Treaty are misaligned with the climate objectives. Because these treaties, they protect the status quo while we are in dire need of change. And yesterday's published uh, World Energy Investment Report of the International Energy Agency, um, and also uh, spelled out very well by Greg in, in his first presentation, that shows that we are still facing a major gap in terms of clean energy investments to reach the 1.5 target. So what is needed are national and international rules that facilitate public and private investments in clean energy, and that discourage carbon intensive investments while ensuring that fossil fuel investors cannot frustrate that transition by claiming compensation for assets that are likely to become stranded and shift the burden of the transition to states and society at large. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bartiak. This is a fascinating insight into the length at which go fossil fuel investors, particularly um, the ones that are now attacking um, the, the Netherlands, to, to, to shift the focus from their historic liability to host states and taxpayers. Now, we are obviously curious to see what the outcome of the ad hoc uh, energy charter conference um, will be tomorrow. Um, but I have another question for Greg that relates to states plans to phase out fossil fuels and the role, the specific role of government officials. According to your experience, um, also um, working with, with BOGA, to what extent um, are government officials that elaborate climate policies aware of ISDS risks? And what else needs to be done to possibly raise um, that awareness? 
Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think part of my answer would be to echo what, what the previous panelists have said. I, I think um, I, I, the, first, the first part of the answer is, is to point to Leah's excellent report. Um, and the, the second part of the answer is, is to uh, point to what Kyla said about, about regulatory chill. And, and, uh, and the third part is what that chap said uh, about the reform conversations. A anecdotally, what I can say is that when I talk to governments and I, I talk to the policy advisors rather than, rather than the lawyers, um, when I give a presentation like, like the one I, I just did, very, very often the response is, but we can't do that because uh, we, we'll, end, we'll end up in an, in an investment arbitration tribunal. And so that, that's partly why I made the distinction in, in my last slide between um, stop making it worse and make it better to align with, with 1.5 degrees. Very commonly where the policy conversation stops is, okay, we can stop making it worse, but um, even if we understand that um, all of these commitments we've, we've already got would uh, not consistent with 1.5 degrees, we as a government are concerned, we can't do more than this. We can't afford to, to have massive payouts. I think what is most needed um, to to overcome this this uh, you know the regulatory chill effect is um, to have more conversation as all of the panelists here are al already contributing to on solutions to this problem of ISDS and ways to um, reduce the scope of ISDS exposure and um, and and uh, avoid and and find legal pathways to um, to un unblock this problem. I think there is, in my experience, awareness among many government officials of, of the problem and much less awareness of, of solutions. And so helping governments see ways forward, I, I think is, is, the, is the most powerful thing that can be done to overcome this. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Greg. I can only agree with the idea of continuing this crucial conversation um, with a particular focus on solutions. So I'm looking at the time um, and it's already well advanced. So I would now like to move to the Q&A session, but before we do, do so, I would like to give Leah as an author of the report, um, the possibility to react or revert to anything that has been said during the panel discussion. So Leah, would you like to come in here and make a comment or statement or um, yeah. react? Just very quickly. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for, for the heartwarming comments. Um, it is very, very important. And uh, I also would like to thank Kyla because she's the first one I came to with this crazy database saying we've got to do something about it. And it's thanks to her that also it is out now at the moment. Um, and um, I just would like to make two very quick comments. There is, I'd like to pick up on, on Kyla invites to um, the consideration about what is a just transition. And there is also an excellent question in the chat um, from, sorry, I'm just going from Eric Casongo that our Southern countries less equipped on arbitration issues are often victims of arbitration awards on complaint initiated by investors. How do you think to fix it? And this is a very important question that goes to the heart of it, especially when you've got countries in the global south with large resources, um, large fossil fuel resources. So in my, in my PhD, I look at these questions and especially I, I focus on the Mozambican case that has, has been developing a new LNG um, mega project, one of the biggest in Africa. And I think it is very important to look at the fairness of it because the, the, um, when uh, we are, considering international investment uh, um, international investment law we have this this knowledge about it but it is not always the case it's like as greg was saying they don't necessarily know about it not even in the global north let alone in some other countries and what happens is that quite the opposite for decades there has been this Mm, discourse of the proponents of the industry that if you adopted these laws and you enter this, this investment agreement, you would have more uh, investments in your country so that will foster development. None of this is actually empirically proved quite 
the contrary. Um, it's more like we have more proof of resource course uh, um, and other things like that happen into these um, global South countries. And on top of that, you have got multicultural development institution that have pushed for the institution. There is a great uh, piece uh, from uh, Bergens and Taylor from 2020 that shows that after the World Bank suggested it, 74 countries have adopted national laws protecting this investment in the global South. So not only there is a lack of, of knowledge of the, the problems and the risks, like it's quite the opposite. It's like we are quite on the opposite. And it's very important to reverse this trend because we cannot allow this, this further development. And just to conclude on, um, I think that countries in the global North have a responsibility to take action, to modernize or terminate uh, these, these, these investments agreements because they, these companies are from the global north and we've got historically a bigger responsibility. So if we want to uh, um, achieve the objective of the Paris agreements of um, making financial flow consistent with to 1.5, it is in their obligation. They're under the obligation to modernize and change these treaties. So I think there is a lot of work to, to be done in that sense. I'll just finish. Sorry, just wanted to. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Leah, for this intervention. That's really helpful and, and valuable. I believe that before uh, moving to the Q&A session, I believe that my colleague Susie uh, Nikim, I would like to make a quick comment on, um, well, the bigger picture and the ISDS reform and also treaty reform that is part, obviously, of our work at, at IISD. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas, for giving me the floor. Actually, I mean, I'm also happy because given the, the time left uh, to, to wait until the end, but I, I just wanted to highlight here that some of the question and comment we are seeing on the chat uh, mean, uh, show that countries are really concerned and, and know about the issues. And as Greg said, the issue is how to deal with that. And it's important to keep this conversation in the broader context of reform, because this is, again, another example of how these kind of treaties and the ICS system related to them is problematic and need to be reformed and change it. So it's also important to always go back to the source of the problem, the existence of this kind of instrument themselves, to see how they can be fixed, uh, in addition to all the kind of policies and reform you have to undertake of course, at national, regional level. But as far as you still have this kind of treaty drafted in that, um, that way, as we know, being dangerous and still having this um, not functioning well as the system, this is all, always a risk for, for countries for climate uh, action, but also for so much other issues, including social issues, human rights issues, et cetera. So I just wanted to put it in light and to say it's a complex issue, but it's important also to go back to the source of a problem at some point to try to fix it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susie. And in the interest of time, I would now like to open um, the Q&A session. And I think we have time to answer maybe three questions. Um, so for that, I would like to turn to Nia Guti to see. I know that there has been a lot of activity on the chat. So I think there is a few questions, if you can maybe yeah, read them out. Thanks, Lucas, and thank you, Susie. I think um, Susie's uh, comments and Leah's and Greg's anticipated a lot of the questions on how to address ISDS and raise the awareness um, of the risks uh, in their country. So a lot of questions actually alluded to that, and I think Susie, Greg, and Leah, you've answered it well. Maybe I can uh, point to quest uh, three questions. So there's a question from uh, one of the participants, what is in your view the legal potential of the precautionary principle and the polluter pays principle referred in Article 19 in the ECT and the possibility for their application in climate change disputes under the ECT? Um, second question is, um, if there exists research that looks at ISDS from the perspective of global financial stability, if we consider the accumulation of potential cases and the collective sovereign financial liability this presents. And maybe a last one. Um, the question in French, maybe if I can read it in English. Um, the large, investment, large investments have been made in research that have resulted in enormous petroleum potential off the coast of my country, which is a developing country, uh, and it involves an operating license. Um, so what can, you, what can you recommend for us to do? 
Thank you very much, Niax, and those are excellent questions. So thanks a lot for um, the members of the audience that have asked these questions. Now, I'd, I'd maybe like to start with the first question, which I think um, alludes to something that Bartiap has already mentioned um, with the principle of uh, precautionary and polluter principles that are also enshrined in the ECT. And I was wondering whether maybe Bartiap, you would like to elaborate a bit further on that. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. It's a very, very good question, a relevant question. Um, just to come up with a quick answer, I can only think of a, a recent report that was done by the Climate Change Council, which is a group of lawyers trying to uh, bring together uh, research on, on climate change and investment law. And I believe there it's a very good report, very well written, very well researched. And I think uh, one of the conclusions was is that precisely Article 19 of the Energy Charter Treaty has been interpreted in, in, in has has almost never been ev uh, uh, invoked uh, in the first place. Um, but also um, the, the, the conclusion of the report is that it doesn't contain any binding commitments on the companies. So if you read the text of Article 19 carefully, you can see that it, 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 it's, it's framed in such a way that it uh, uh, reconfirms uh, the commitment that states have uh, to uh, international environmental agreements uh, and so on. So it's a more or less a reaffirmation that, uh, that, that states uh, have committed themselves uh, to certain international norms and rules, but it does not place any legally binding rules on uh, corporations in terms of corporate social responsibility and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite skeptical that, uh, that this is a, a way to go forward and to uh, uh, um, yeah, successfully try to influence arbitral tribunals in, in, in their decision to, to uh, take into account uh, like climate change issues and, and other environmental issues. But that's my perception. Maybe other panelists have a more positive view of this. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, if, if other panelists would like to come in on that uh, question as well, feel free to do so. I would just add that there are other treaties have these sort of environmental type exceptions in them as well, and they're re very rarely invoked, but in one recent case where an exception was actually invoked and the tribunal said it did apply, they still decided that there was still a duty to pay compensation. So I think that that kind of, that's an echo oro case it's a mining case not a fossil fuel one but i i think that this shows that all of this kind of trying to tweak the language and and get more precise uh things written in there is is really kind of an exercise in futility it may may help with some tribunals but they have so much leeway to make decisions really based on their their own views of things um and so that's why i i in terms of talking about solutions more broadly i advocate for termination but obviously there are difficulties for the these countries uh like the one that was was mentioned that has you know has oil concessions opening up in their country in global south that if you try to terminate a, a, a treaty unilaterally you may end up with this sunset clause which can protect uh existing investments for for 10 or 20 years uh so this is where we get sort of stuck on on solutions uh and that goes back i think to what leo was saying what we really need countries in the global north to take some responsibility here uh, as Lucas mentioned, this this is really part of the responsibility that they've they've signed up to in terms of of climate finance, uh, and so they should be willing to to terminate, especially these particularly old treaties uh, that are are particularly egregious, but um, also not not going around telling uh, through the World Bank or other um, mechanisms that that telling countries that they need to do this to attract investment because there is no evidence on that. And just to quickly jump in on another thing I saw in the chat, there's no evidence that it, it helps to facilitate any form of investment, which includes renewable energy investment. So any suggestion that we need this for the energy transition is greenwashing. It's really something that uh, arbitrators and defenders of ISDS have picked up on because they think that it can convince people that we, we should try to keep this. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is no baby. This is, this is what I keep trying to say. Um, and all of the evidence of the, the cases like in Spain where incentive, uh, incentive schemes for renewable energy were changed, the companies were still profiting, they just weren't making as much. And we need countries to have flexibility to make those kinds of changes. There's gonna be a lot of policy experimentation as we uh, deal with the energy transition. We can't afford to have uh, countries hamstrung and forced into to schemes that um, are gonna really be difficult for them financially. So 
forget about the renewable energy arguments. It's greenwashing. Thanks. Yes, thanks a lot uh, for, you, for your, your excellent answers. Now, I do think we have time to answer the second question. I'm not sure if we can get to the third one, but um, I think it's an excellent question about the macroeconomic impact of ISDS and whether, you know, how, how, whether and how ISDS um, could impact global financial stability if we consider the accumulation of potential cases um, related to the, uh, the clean energy transition. So I'll just leave it to any of you to um, come in with any ideas or, or answers to that question, which I think is, uh, yeah, will require probably more, more um, research, but um, yeah. I don't know if any of you, uh, of you would like to come in here. I don't think anyone has an idea. So that seems to be, you know, a, another challenge and maybe uh, a, a topic for uh, another PhD. <laughs> so um, yeah, with that, it's a, that was an excellent discussion. So um, I'm looking at the time, you can see that we've already reached um, somewhat the end of uh, our session today. So before closing the session, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments and fill out the evaluation form um, that I believe has been posted on the chat. Um, so that will allow us to further improve the quality of our webinars in the future. And then also to just inform all of our uh, participants today that we will make uh, the video recording in all three um, languages available on our website and also the, the PowerPoint uh, slides that have been shared by Greg and Leah. And um, with that, I would like to wrap up the session, thanking Leah on behalf of um, all of IISD for the great collaboration um, in the preparation of this report. And obviously also our esteemed panelists today and our presenters, for the excellent discussion and input. I do believe we should do this more often um, to break down silos and um, especially the ones um, of climate science and uh, international investment law. I would also like to thank our interpreters for the excellent work in translating what is a very technical discussion, um, as well as the members of the IAS team, team that have been working behind the scenes to make this possible, including Susie, Sally, Niaguti, David, Lizian, and Sotonie. So thank you all very much, um, and I, I wish you a pleasant day.